Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. He's a man who uh, many people feel better equipped to be president of the United States than any man being suggested by either party. He's a man with a wealth of experience in legislation and public service. He's a man that served in the House of Representatives for 12 years and the United States Senate for 22 years. In 1960, at the request of President John Kennedy, he was named National Democratic Chairman. 1972, he was a runner-up to George McGovern for the presidential nomination, received 525 delegate votes. He's a man that's dedicated his life to public service. He's a friend of mine, and I'm sure that once you have the opportunity to meet him, to question him, to get better acquainted with him, that he'll be a friend of yours, just as he's a friend of mine. I'd like for you to give a good Missouri welcome to a man that many people feel is going to be the next president of the United States, Senator Scoop Jackson from Washington. Senator. Great. This is the way we do politics in Missouri. I've heard about town meetings, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a show me state. Still is. <laughs> what I like about it, it's also a Harry Truman state. Because <laughs> when I was in the house, I supported Harry Truman when a lot of people were running for cover because he was taking on some very unpopular issues that they now say he was absolutely right. And I knew he was right because not just that he came from Missouri, but Harry Truman could make tough, difficult decisions. And he could say no and mean it. I think uh, we need a little of that in her toughness. And he, in my judgment, is one of the greatest statesmen of this century. Doubt it out, doubt it out. So uh, it's great to be with a great congressman, the rising star, may I say. In the United States Congress, Jerry Litton, and we're delighted to be here and to uh, learn a little more about what's on the minds of the people, Jerry, of your constituency. I think you've done a great, great thing. You know, they say that people are losing interest in politics. They're not losing interest in Jerry Litton's district or in Jerry Litton. <laughs> Senator, these people here are from all over uh, Missouri. I think perhaps we have some folks in Kansas and Iowa. Uh, we have microphones out in the audience. We never really know what's going to be uh, asked, uh, but uh, they're usually very courteous and very kind, and because of these meetings, I think far more knowledgeable than the average citizen of this country. I like to ask the people to come to the microphones. Uh, if you can find your way through the crowd, give us your name and your hometown, and ask whatever happens to be on your mind. Let over here yet. Senator, uh, as one of the Missouri delegation who supported you wholeheartedly and 100% in 1972, I want to wish you a lot of luck in 1976. Thank you, Thank you. you see, I arranged for the order of questioning. <laughs> Do I get my autograph picture now? 
I've been signing some blank checks over here. I didn't realize it until I turned it over. But, but I would for you. After all, uh, you've, you've uh, made a good start, I mean, for me. Before I ask my question, uh, I would just like to make one more comment, and that is that if you happen to be looking for a good vice president, we think we've got the guy right up there. <laughs> Jerry Litton is qualified for any office, the highest if necessary. <laughs> Say that. I, I'm very, very proud of what he's been able to do, and certainly uh, he's worthy of the highest consideration. Now they think I had him planted too. <laughs> no, I think it was mutual. He looked like he took care of both of us. <laughs> I'll guarantee you one thing, Senator, he's going to be far and above and long away better than what we've been putting up with in that office since 1968. What do you foresee for this country in the way of energy, and specifically, what do you think the likelihood is of rationing occurring in this country, as the press has indicated, you think is a real possibility? Well, I think the first duty of President Ford, and I say this not in any partisan spirit at all, is to make a full disclosure to the country regarding the trouble that we're in. We're in deep, deep energy trouble. A free enterpriser. I want to see industry have an incentive to produce. I came up the hard way. I had to work my way up. I come from a working class family. I washed dishes and waited on tables through college. I started a newspaper route and sold papers. I know what hard work is. And I believe in incentives and make it possible people to get out and work but I'm against obscene profits in the oil industry, number one. Why, one oil company said they, you know, they say they need all this money to drill. One of them kept drilling and drilling and drilling. You know what they hit? Montgomery Ward, they took it over. <laughs> no, really, I, and, and $800 million worth. And the largest industrial corporation in America can't even earn enough to pay their dividends, General Motors. Last quarter, they earned five cents, Jerry, and their dividend was 85 cent cents. Up in the Northwest, uh, we, we would say there's something rotten in Denmark. Second thing is massive conservation, rationing if necessary. I want it to be equitable. I'm against putting 20 cent tax on gasoline. Let's share the burden equally. <laughs> Third, I want massive production of the oil that is yet to be tapped. Look, just think of this a minute. There's 600 billion barrels of oil in the world, reserve. We only have 35 billion. But do you know there are 200 billion that haven't been touched? And I say, let us increase our food production. And it can be a countervailing force against the Arab oil cartel because food is more important than oil. Boy, if you get, I'll tell you, I'm gonna, I'm afraid, Jerry, I'm gonna be making speeches here and spoil your oh, program. I was, I was just thinking, you're right in the midst of a mighty important food production area yes, here. Sir. And I come from a great food producing state. We export 87% of our wheat. We got cattle. We have everything but tobacco. See, I don't know really you have tobacco well, in We have area. some in Missouri. Sure we do. I quit smoking when I was 12, and I don't... <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I can say for the people here, and there's a lot of uh, agricultural interest here. If the farmers in this area feel that there's enough profit and price in their product, they'll produce more food than America can eat or store. Absolutely. <laughs> I've supported the farm support programs, and we need to put a floor under the price so the farmer will know that if he goes all out in production, he's not going to be holding a sack of whatever it is. I didn't agree with this fellow Butts. I don't know how you like Butts, but uh, <laughs> he's caused more problems in the farm thing, but uh, as a Democrat, I suppose it'd be good to keep him there. I... I'm quite sure that if the Soviet government were to insist that before it would agree to expand the trade with us, we must amnesty all war protesters or something of that sort. There wouldn't be a single senator or congressman who would support that idea. 
How can you, therefore, insist, however sympathetic we might be, that before we will agree to expand the trade with the Soviet bloc, they must take certain actions with regard to altering their domestic policy if we would not be willing to agree to the same kind of condition in other other words, way around. In other words, what you're saying, are we interfering in the affairs, domestic affairs of the Soviet Union? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm All simply right. saying, how can we attach a condition to expanded trade on our side when we would not accept a similar condition? Well, first of there? all, they don't have anything that we really need except maybe the reduction of their strategic arms, which they're building up at a massive rate, and it's high time that we blow the whistle on that one, not subsidize it like the administration's proposing to do. Here's the point. In 1948, the UN developed, uh, passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 13, which simply said a person had the right to leave a country freely and return freely. That was codified into international law in 1969, so that the Soviet Union being a signatory to that convention are obligated by international law to live up to it. I agree with the idea of extending freedom, but I wonder whether attaching advanced conditions before ag agreeing to making trade easier isn't missing an opportunity to do just that. If we were to go ahead and expand trade, wouldn't that in increase contacts and perhaps uh, accomplish just what you're talking about? Sir, we're, what, what we're doing and what I object to with this administration, they don't know the, how to hard bargain with the Russians. They're giving them hundreds of millions of credit without any conditions, and they're giving it at 6%. That's what I'm fighting. Can you get any 6% loans? I might add, uh, Senator, we're just uh, not too many feet away from the TWA uh, headquarters here, and many of the people in this area are well aware of the fact that to the World Import-Export Bank, competing airlines around the world, uh, the TWA must compete against have been able to buy their aircraft through the World Import-Export Bank through the help of the United States, that subsidize low rate interest loans, TWA must pay 10 and 11 percent uh, to buy the same American-made aircraft to compete against foreign airlines, and this is one of the reasons they're in trouble now. George Crispin from Grandview, Missouri. Do you feel America can keep the welfare system we now have? And if so, how can we afford to support it? Well, when I look down the road, the things that America should be doing and I have some ideas in that regard. There's no reason why any person who's able-bodied should not be working. It is that we have done an inadequate job of training people for useful purposes in society and training them for a job. And, uh, You're right, Jerry. And uh, among the minorities and the poor, uh, they drop out and they don't have the skills. And we have the anomalous situation, as you know, all these skilled jobs can't be filled while you've got people unemployed. And today, this is so important for the youth to understand, a machine can do the job of a high school graduate, a machine with automation. So that this program of vocational and technical training, starting right in the slums and the ghettos, I think is absolutely essential. How can we justify selling arms to both sides recently agreeing to sell to Egypt when recently Russia gave them a nuclear reactor with no limitations whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, let me try to emphasize as strongly as I can that the United States is in a beautiful position to bargain with the Russians. We have the economic things they need, desperately need, and when I have something that you want, you know, that's when I should be driving a hard bargain. And I would tell them in no uncertain terms, we're not going to allow you to stir up mischief, start wars, cause trouble for the Western world, and at the same time, ask handouts from the United States. And that's what they are, they're handouts. The problems with our, our giveaways around the world, Senator, and I think the people here will pretty much agree with your position. The end of World War II, we were the mightiest power on Earth. We still are, but we looked at uh, destroyed Europe. We looked at Japan that was destroyed. We looked at England and France, and uh, we, were the, we were standing there. So we decided to be humanitarian souls, and we decided to help ourselves, too, by rebuilding the world to have a place to sell our product. 
Well, we've still maintained a foreign aid posture on the basis of the situation as it was in the 40s and not as it is economically in the 70s. And we've decided that we're going to continue to rebuild Europe. Europe's been rebuilt for years. How much strength within the party does Governor George Wallace have at this time? George Wallace, uh polls speak for themselves. I think he has a, a certain hardcore strength uh, in the nation. How great would you assess it at this point? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I don't conduct the polls. <laughs> uh, he has a plus and a minus. He has very strong support and affirmative, and then he has an even larger negative support, non-acceptability. And that becomes a critical factor, and you have to put the two together. Would you consider George Wallace as your running mate? Well, I'll make... <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a direct... <laughs> I, I don't believe in the politics of exclusion. What I will do... If I'm nominated, I will recommend to the convention the person that I think is best qualified to be president in case something should happen to the nominee. And I'll make that recommendation to the convention on a non-exclusionary basis. I don't have any idea who it'll be now because I have no idea where I'll be. You're saying you would not exclude Pardon me? You're saying then that you would not exclude Governor Wallace. I would not exclude Governor Wallace. I don't believe in the politics of exclusion. I'll make up my own mind and I will recommend that nominee that person to the convention and I'll abide by the decision of the convention. Thank but you. I don't believe in running from it. I think one of the problems we have with a possible candidacy of Governor Wallace for president is the situation that the Democratic Party is a very broad party with a big umbrella encompassing uh, divergent uh, views and philosophies. And we've already tried a candidate who represents one far aspect of the party and we didn't succeed too well. And I would suspect that if we tried another candidate that represented the other side, we might meet with similar. No, I think the job is, to, you know, all Americans want to be brought back together again. I'd like to hear the senator's evaluation of this limited arms agreement that the president has worked out with Russia. They say a cap is put on it. Well, they put a cap on Mount Everest, is what they did. What I want is a mutual <laughs> reduction on the basis of equality on arms. And I'd tell the Russians in no uncertain terms that we're not going to give you one dime of aid of any kind, of technological know-how, you name it. And they're in the, well, they're in the 19th century. When you get right down to it, they're so far behind us in terms of standard of living and meeting the needs of their people. I would say, we will help you, but you get your house in order first. Why should you be building all these additional arms? What are they for? You've already got more in the way of nuclear arms in the United States. Let's both nations build down, save billions of dollars on both sides so we can do the things we need to do here at home. Right over here. Senator Jackson, well, my name is Jim Smith from Grandview. Senator Jackson, Congressman Lytton, it is a privilege to be able to stand here and see the future president and vice president. <laughs> Well, I'm very proud of Jerry Litton. I, I know of no congressman who's come so fast because uh, since the missile age. Uh. <laughs> let, me, let me inject, and some of you may have read the paper when it first came out. I, yeah, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I called mother. She said she read it in the paper, the headline for vice president. I said, what did you think? And she said, I said to myself, vice president of what? <laughs> Well, if we don't get 100 percent, at least we'll have 50 percent sitting right here. Uh, last time, Jerry, I remember I asked your, or Congressman Linton, I asked your opinion and your philosophy on the aid to countries in regards to food. I would like to ask Senator Jackson his viewpoints on giving food to countries 
but possibly what the qualifications like Jerry said, if you don't help yourself, we're not going to help you. Please, Senator, do you have any opinions on that, on how you would donate food to these countries that are starving? I don't want to be brutal about when it comes to people who are hungry. Children, I think we, have, we should feed. They can't be responsible for the mistakes of their parents. I'm talking about around the world and their government. And I think we need to recognize that fact. But I get fed up with a country like India and spend all their time denouncing us and say we discriminate against people and they've got the worst caste system in the world. And uh, I don't believe in interfering with the person's religion, but there's a limit to, uh, you know, what they, the worship of animals, and they've got people starving to death, and, they, and there are the animals dying for want of proper treatment, treating them as a part of a religious rite. Now, there comes a point, and I think we've been very patient with India, where this nonsense has to stop. Senator, I think one of the questions that he had in his mind in a bill that I introduced after the World Food Conference when I was over there disturbed me, as I'm sure it did you and many Americans, to find over 100 of the 130 countries standing in line to knock the United States. And it disturbed me also to find that the population conference, that uh, they were not interested in following any suggestion of the United States, the whole population in check. Bangladesh, uh, a country the size of Missouri, and uh, your state will have as many people as the United States of America in, in 25 years. The bill I introduced said this, and that is that in the PL 480 program, the billion dollars, nearly a billion dollars that we give away each uh, year, none of that money, with the exception of emergency conditions, would go to any country whose population growth exceeds that of the world average, where that country is not making some reasonable effort to hold their population within check. I'll be glad to co-sponsor it. Thank you. Uh, our customers are having difficulty buying material because the cost is so high. They're paying too much for money at the banks because the interest rates are too high. There are, the automobiles and the farm implements where we furnish materials aren't being bought, and as a result, there's unemployment. Uh, we all know when we go to the grocery store and do our shopping how the inflation has hit every one of us. What constructive measures do you recommend to Congress to help us solve our immediate economy problem? I'd recommend, number one, roll back on oil prices here at home. That'll take 12 to $15 billion out. It'll affect the cost of fertilizer, your light bill. I go on and on and on. Massive conservation, all of these things to hit the oil cartel. We can save a million barrels right away out of the six million we're importing. Our allies can add millions of barrels a day to that, reduce the demand for it, hitting at the price structure, massive production, and massive food product, massive production of oil and massive food production as a countervailing force. Wage and price controls. I would support and have in the closet a whole series of options available, price, wage, profits, right across the board, restraints. I would jawbone first and put controls on as the last resort. I was glad to hear you say a last resort, because I hope it's the last I resort. I say it's the last resort. <laughs> We've only got about three or four minutes left. I, I thought I would, would add, we, the problem of recession and inflation, and the problem is like the young fellow with, with a friend out in the pasture, and he attracted the attention of a big bull, and the, the bull chased the boys. One was the taller than the other. When he went up a tree, he got some protection. The other boy jumped into a hole in the ground. The bull went on by, and the boy jumped out of the hole, and back came the bull again. And then he went back into the hole, and then it happened three or four times. Finally, the boy in the tree looked down, and he said, don't you know anything at all? Stay in that hole. For the fourth time he jumped out, he said, you don't know everything. There's a bear in this hole. <laughs> That's why they call it the show me stage. <laughs> Well, our problem is with inflation and recession is what we normally want to do to solve the problems of inflation, adds the fuels to flame to recession and vice versa. You come out of the hole, you get away from the bear, you get run over the bull. You go back into the hole, you get run over the bear. And, and I, I think you're right. We must admit to the American people it's a tough problem and there's no easy answers. Anyone who says he has all the answers 
have them checked out for the local institution. One last question. Let's try to make it quick. Senator, do you think that the middle class, middle income American, the real majority, will be able to find a place in the Democratic Party's platform in 1976? The okay. I if they make the right decision on the nomination, they will. <laughs> Folks, may I, may I just say that uh, I've traveled around, talked to a lot of groups, but I've never had a more responsive, more forthright, folksy, down-to-earth group of people than I have this afternoon. And I, I'm, I'm very, very proud of your congressman for being an innovator and making the system work. People say, you know, we don't get a chance to participate. I find the most discouraging thing in politics People yak and yak and yak. When everything's going fine, you can't get them out to a meeting. But when things are going rough, they all show up. <laughs> but I want to say that Jerry has set an example here that I think should be followed, I'd like to see, frankly, in every congressional district in the country. And I think America would be stronger and more unified for it because uh, you'd have a better feel of things and you'd understand why we are fallible and why we make mistakes and that we're not God, but that we can do better, do better. And this is the fellow who's been, I think, responsible for <laughs> responsible for reinvigorating the democratic process. And this is at the heart of it, participation. And if you don't participate in it, it can wither and die. What's the old motto? Eternal vigilance is a price of freedom. And when we neglect it, we get into trouble and we have no one to blame but ourselves. And they listen to Jerry Litton, we're going to be out of it a lot faster. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming and those of you who can't come to these uh, open to the public town meetings. We invite you to join us on uh, some 12 different uh, television stations, 11 radio stations around the country. Join us next month when we again have dialogue with Lytton. Thank you. You have been watching Dialogue with Lytton. Jerry Litton believes that government should be open and accessible to the people, that people should have a say in their government. That's what Dialogue with Litton is all about. Be sure to continue to watch it on this station.